Good morning and welcome to Rich Thoughts for Breakfast. I'm Harold Herring and that's my fine wife, Beth. Over the past three days, we've been discussing seven deadly sins. And we think we're going to finish it today. Sounds good. <laughs> that's seven deadly, D-E-B-T-L-Y, sins. That's right. So let's have a brief review. One, my background circumstances and surroundings do not determine my financial destiny. And here are seven reasons why. First, you're not on a fixed income. Second, you need to eliminate the poverty mentality. Third, gain the victory over the victim complex. Fourth, stop making negative confessions. Fifth, stop looking to them and begin looking to him. Sixth, don't insult God by denying his word with the words of your mouth. And seventh, be careful about whom you associate with. Number two, I can't afford to tithe and give offerings. James 4.17, James 4.17, classic Amplified Bible. So any person who knows what is right to do but does not do it, to him it's a sin. If God tells us to tithe and give offerings, and he does, then not to tithe and give offerings is a deadly sin. It'll also bring you into trouble. Number three, it's too good of a bargain to pass up. Look, if we cannot afford it, it is never a bargain. Right. It's definitely a deadly sin to spend money we don't have on what we consider to be a bargain. We either don't need it or don't need it at this moment in time. Proverbs 21.20 in the Living Bible says, The wise man saves for the future, but the foolish man spends whatever he gets. There will always be a bargain. And in the history of the universe, one bargain is always going to be replaced by another. That's true. Number four, living paycheck to Prozac. Psalm 119.143, 119.143, New Living Translation. As pressure and stress bear down on me, I find joy in your commands. Hear this now. The word will not eliminate stress from attacking you, but it will destroy it. First Thessalonians 3 7. First Thessalonians 3 7. Classic Amplified Bible. Well, it's a stress reliever when it says, Brethren, for this reason, in spite of all our stress and crushing difficulties, we have been filled with comfort and cheer about you. Because of your faith, the leaning of your whole personality on God, and complete trust and confidence. Here are seven ways we discuss seven ways to uh, that are more effective than Prozac in dealing with stress on a personal level. First, spend more time in the Word and in His presence. Second, communicate without playing the blame game. Third, exercise will free your mind and liberate your body. Fourth, eat properly. Fifth, sleep right. Sixth, guard your heart. And seventh, shake up your routine. Now let's pick up where we left off on yesterday's call. Number five, when I hear, see, or write the phrase, failure to communicate, I'm reminded of the warden in the Paul, Paul Newman movie, Cool Hand Luke, who was always saying, what we have here, that's where you said it. That's it. What we have here is a failure to communicate. So five is failure to communicate. A failure to communicate with your creditors when you're dead mm. can be a costly mistake. And let me tell you, <clears throat> excuse me, let us tell you, the most dangerous game a person can play in a marriage or in a relationship is a blame game where nobody wins, everybody loses, and the problem is never solved. And another really important fact is to always communicate with your spouse about what's really going on. Don't let them find it in the mail. Tell them the (laughs) truth, the whole truth. And nothing but the truth. The fact that you're broke, unsuccessful, don't know which way to turn well, don't be saying, it's your mama's fault, it's your daddy's fault, it's your school teacher's fault, your employer's fault, it's your spouse's fault. If you hadn't bought that new truck, we wouldn't be in this mess. Well, if you hadn't gone overboard and buying Christmas gifts for every single member of your family, we'd be able to pay off this credit card. This, you could go on and on and on. And on and on. And on and on and on. Here's the point. Don't say it's not my fault, it's yours. If you say that, stop it. 
even if it is somebody else's fault. You just need to kind of, you know. And communicate until you can be friends. Proverbs 17, 9. Proverbs 17, verse 9, New International Version. Great advice. He who covers over an offense promotes love, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. Laying the blame for financial mistakes on each other solves nothing. Don't fix the blame. Fix the problem. That's it. Six, who needs a financial plan? The most difficult part of any assignment or journey is the first step. Don't let the enemy of your success keep you from organizing your priorities and your life. Ecclesiastes 11.4, great advice again. Ecclesiastes 11 verse 4, the Living Bible. If you wait for perfect conditions, you'll never get anything done. If you are in debt or living in lack, the only way out is with the Word of God as your guide in a spirit-directed plan. Luke 14, 28. Luke 14, verse 28, Living Bible says, But don't begin until you count the cost. For who would build construction, begin construction of a building without first getting estimates and then checking to see if he has enough money to pay the bills? We have to count the cost especially on the interest we're paying. Albert Einstein, considered one of the smartest men that ever lived, was asked what was the greatest invention he'd ever seen. And it, honestly, it's surprising. You would think it would be something in physics, but instead he said, without hesitation, compound interest. It's a huge financial mistake to, take, to not take into account what interest means to you. And it's clear to us that our Heavenly Father wants us to be wise stewards. In fact, he wants us to earn interest on the money he's entrusted to us. That was what he laid out in his plan. Because you can read it in Luke 19, verse 22. Luke 19, verse 22, the Message Bible says it this way. He said, you're right that I don't suffer fools gladly, and you've acted the fool. Why didn't you at least invest the money in securities so what I would have gotten a little interest on it? Yeah. If your financial affairs are in disarray, you need to know where you're at before you can develop your goals for financial freedom. That's right. Here are several keys. First, you, you're not doing, if you're not doing so already, balance your checkbook. Balance your checkbook. Second, track your spending for the next 30 days, either through smartphone apps like Expense Tracker or Easy Spending Expense Tracker. Both iPhone and Android have them. If you don't have a smartphone, get a Spiral Ring notebook, write down every single penny you spent for a 30 day period. You'll be amazed at the money that you'll be able to redirect. Now, this may not seem like your kind of fun, but let me tell you, it won't be fun the day you realize that you're broke, busted, and wallowing in a poverty mentality. So, believe me, it's worth it. Here's the good news. Once you know where your money is going, then you can redirect, redirect it to other places. Once you have the facts, you can then begin to list your actions and the priorities and sequence, otherwise the timeline. Hebrews, yeah, go. Sorry. Hebrews 3.19 in the Message Bible, Hebrews 3 verse 19 says, they never got there because they never listened, never believed. Wow. Third, create an out-of-debt plan. We have frequently offered our master plan as a gift to those who would focus on their goal of being debt-free. The master plan is an interactive PDF which allows us to know the day, the month, the year that we'll be debt-free. Fourth, inspect what you expect. Continually monitor your out-of-debt plan and your financial habits. Fifth, <clears throat> excuse me, fifth, keep the Holy Spirit at the center of your financial plan. Proverbs 16, 3. Proverbs 16, verse 3. I always say it, but it's the truth. One of my favorite scriptures reveals what will happen when we give things over to God. It says, commit your work to the Lord, then it will succeed. Hallelujah. I love it. <laughs> Seventh, always focus on what you don't have. Well, that's a deadly sin for sure. Amen. We encourage you to write down the next statement that we're going to give you, because it's absolutely life-changing. Here it is. If you're not faithful with what you got, 
that's all you'll ever get. If you're not faithful with what you got, that's all you ever get. If you're not faithful where you are with what you've got, you'll never arrive in any other destination other than where you are at the moment. If you're not faithful where you are with what you got, it'll take more than MapQuest or GPS to help you find your way out of mediocrity. If you're not faithful where you are with what you've got, you'll never have to worry about future success because you'll never find it. If you're not faithful where you are with what you've got, you'll never hear God say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And if you're not faithful where you are with what you got, then he will never reveal to you secret riches and hidden treasures. And let me I want to mark this in here, too. If you're being faithful and the enemy tries to give you the slam dunk, you're just going to have to hold on because God will always re- reward the faithful. So he expects us to be faithful as well. And in 1 Corinthians 1, 9, in 1 Corinthians 1, the New Living Translation says, God will do this, for he is faithful to do what he says, and he has invited you into partnership with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So believe me, it will work out in the end if you are being faithful. If we're made in his image and after his likeness, which it says in Genesis 1:26, then we just need to be doing what he does. If he's faithful to do what he says, then we should be too. And we need to be thankful for what we've got, even as we praise him for the blessings yet to come. Now we want to provoke your thinking about the phone calls we've shared over the past four or five, four days, I guess. If you want a better tomorrow, you must let go of your desire for a better yesterday. That's right. You cannot continually think about what was or what could have been if you want to create a new reality of what will be. Ecclesiastes 11.4, 11.4 in the Living Bible, one of our favorite scriptures. That's right. If you wait for perfect conditions, you'll never get anything done. And there's one last scripture we want to read you on these, from these days of seven deadly sins that we've been discussing. It's in Proverbs 4, verse 23, Proverbs 4.23, and we chose the New Century Version. It says, be careful what you think because your thoughts run your life. That's critically important to eliminating deadly sins. If you think you'll never be debt free, you're right, you won't be. But if you believe, if you take the word, grab a hold of it and know that God wants you to be be debt free, you start doing the things we've talked about these past four or five days, then change is gonna come to your financial life and you will become debt free. That's right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Go to HaroldHerring.com. Check out this week's two-minute video. And while you're there, if you've been blessed by the teaching, up at the top where it says, sow a seed, just ask God what seed he'd have you put in the ground. Do what he says. That's all we ever ask. And until tomorrow morning at 830 Eastern, God bless you. Happy trails. And keep thinking rich thoughts. We love you. We appreciate you. God bless you. Bye-bye.